Good morning. So we are going to pick up where we left off. Uh, we were just about to talk about um, these vaccines in development for COVID-19. And uh, I think I showed you this slide here. And so like I said, this is where I wanna pick up and uh, talk a little bit about what uh, is being done and uh, quite a bit, in fact, uh, there's nothing ever been like this ever before in terms of the amount of money and resources being thrown at a particular uh, project like this. And uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about what's been going on and it, it really has been very hard to keep track of it because there's been so much information out there. But uh, if you look at all those uh, vaccine types that we talked about before, I talked about attenuated vaccines, killed vaccines, uh, toxoid vaccines, um, subunit conjugate vaccines. And I also mentioned the new types, the nucleic acids and the viral vector vaccines. And uh, all of these things here are, uh, are being thrown at uh, this COVID-19 pandemic thing, except for maybe the toxoid vaccine because uh, the, the uh, virus doesn't really actually produce a toxin. Um, so I found this nice graphic here from an article. This actually was published way back in May. Uh, so some of the data has changed, but uh, the strategies have not. And uh, obviously the vaccines are a little bit further on in terms of uh, where they're at uh, in terms of development. Um, they made this little chart here talking about uh, uh, vaccine candidates. I really don't like it when they say vaccine. They should be really saying vaccine candidate because uh, these aren't vaccines yet. These are just things that are being researched. And uh, as far as I could tell, there's at least 200 uh, projects going on worldwide, uh, probably quite a bit more if you think about all those early stages. And uh, like I said, pretty much every vaccine strategy we have available to us, we're trying to do um, for COVID-19. Uh, you can see that uh, some of the more popular methods are protein-based. Uh, there's been, um, I'm a little surprised this graph doesn't show the virus methods, meaning uh, attenuated viruses are kind of the classical oldest uh, tried and true method. There are quite a few groups doing that. The Russians are working on that and the Chinese are working on that. And both of them um, have actually been testing in their military and uh, have, have made announcements about how it's, it's great, but I, I don't think they're really out of phase three trials yet. Um, so like I said, at least 200 candidates. Uh, there are a bunch of vaccine tracker websites out there. This is a one that's put together by the University of McGill. So I figured I'd give you a Canadian vaccine tracker. Uh, I think the New York Times has one. Uh, you can go to the World Health Organization. A little bit harder to find information there. You have to dig a little bit. And, and they're all given kind of similar, but not all the same numbers. So like I said, we're looking at more than 200 vaccine candidates. Uh, this is just tracking the ones that are actually being trialed in humans. Uh, so they're saying about 57 in humans. And actually, I checked this, I think, uh, a week before this, and it was at 53. So the numbers are changing like uh, every couple of days, which is great. It shows the amount of progress that we're getting uh, on these things. So just a quick um, kind of overview with the trials, what that means. So uh, before it gets to this stage, you can imagine all the things that are going on uh, in a lab and animals, testing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the phase one is when we're actually ready to get into humans. So phase one basically means we're gonna get a small number of humans, so probably uh, 20 or less, uh, and we're basically gonna inject them and, uh, and, and watch out for any um, safety concerns, right? So typically these trials are sometimes 10 males, um, sorry ladies, uh, you know, males are more ideal candidates as research subjects um, because they're not having uh, changes in their pH and, and uh, things like that. Uh, um, they just tend to be more predictable um, subjects. So males are often what's done. Uh, in this case, I think they are trying to get males and females, but we're talking about young, healthy adults basically is what we're looking at here. Uh, phase two is where they're rolling it out to a few hundred people. Okay, so the, they've decided that, okay, it's, uh, it's not uh, giving any severe side effects. Uh, let's take a better look at that. So phase two is also for, so for, also for safety. Uh, in this case, they're going to uh, be a little bit more, uh, they might have a placebo. So let's say 100 placebo, non-placebo. And, uh, and they're also looking for an immune reaction uh, in phase two. 
So what they want to do is uh, they're going to take blood samples from the individuals and look for antibodies, and that's it. They're not actually looking to see if it's preventing disease. A couple hundred people is not enough uh, for that kind of thing. So phase three, this is kind of the big time where you're looking at 30, 40,000 people, sometimes more. And uh, in this case here, you're looking at a very controlled, double-blinded kind of study where half the people are on a placebo and half the people are getting the real shot. And what you're doing is you're, you're hoping that some of them will get sick, right? Um, you know, uh, kind of, you know, you're hoping it, but you're not hoping it, right? Like you want everyone to be fine. But you know, when you, when you uh, test 30,000 people, uh, some of them are going to get exposed to the disease, right? And uh, to make it statistically significant, they usually need, I think, you know, the numbers like a couple hundred people to get sick or something like that. And so, and then what you're going to do after the results come in, uh, you know, they, they take a look and see who was in the vaccine trial group and who was in the placebo group, and then they're looking for a difference. And uh, hopefully what you're going to see is the people who had the vaccine candidate, very few of them are going to be sick. And, uh, and most of the sick people are going to be in the control group, and that means you've had some success there. Plus, with 30,000 people, you can also start to look for a lot more rare side effects, right? Uh, you know, and you're going, to test, uh, you're going to test some older people and some younger people, uh, those kind of things. Um, depending on the trial, uh, they may even test pregnant women. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's the case they're doing for these trials yet or not. But phase three tends to be very massive, very expensive. And, uh, but this is kind of the last stage before it gets approved to go into humans. And then after that, it's going to be reviewed by the government, probably go into emergency use uh, first before it gets rolled out to uh, uh, other high priority people. And so I think in this case, the high priority people they're identifying as healthcare workers that are at risk and, uh, and elderly people. So uh, what is Canada doing? Canada has spent uh, quite a bit of money already. Uh, in various projects. Uh, there's five projects that they've invested the most in, about a billion dollars. And all these vaccines are in later stages of trials. So they don't want to put all their eggs in one basket. They've decided to try a bunch of different uh, companies that are trying different techniques. And uh, uh, you, know, you know, hopefully at least one or two of them will come through with a successful vaccine is the whole idea. So really the whole thing is here, you know, they gave uh, Pfizer, I think it was $200 million and they said, you know, if your vaccine's successful, uh, you're, you can promise us, you know, uh, um, 15 million of the, of the first doses or something like that, right? If it's not successful, they don't get the money back. But this is how you speed up vaccine development. You throw a lot of money at it, right? And it still has to go through all the safety hoops and all those kind of things. So a lot of these companies are multinational companies found in, uh, you know, they might be based out of the states, um, but they're really found worldwide. Like Pfizer is found, I think there's a branch in Montreal and there's branches in Europe and there's branches all over the place. So yeah, if all these fall through, yeah, uh, we're, we're out for a billion dollars basically, yeah. And uh, I think, you know, we're trying to be optimistic and hoping that, um, that at least one or two of them work. If we end up with extra doses, generally what Canada does, uh, we do this with our flu shot. If we have extra doses, uh, we, we sell them to a developing country and, and we actually sell them at a loss because uh, we understand that a lot of countries can't afford to pay full price for them. Um, so probably that kind of thing will happen. So yeah, um, and, and this, is, this has been actually in the news just recently. Uh, so Pfizer had made the big announcement, this was about a week ago, a little bit more than a week ago, uh, and they said that they had found their vaccine was 90% effective. So I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like, um, uh, I think it was something like uh, 110 people got sick and, and uh, only 10 of them were in the, in the vaccine group and 100 of them were in the control group, something like that, right? So that's why they're saying it's 90% effective. And they found it was 95% effective for um, uh, people older, sick, over 60, which is great. So uh, they're at the stage of now applying for um, use in, you know, emergency use in humans, which is the, the first step to, to wide use. Um, and uh, I, I can't remember how many doses they figure they can get in the new year. And uh, of course, you know, uh, governments that have had, uh, that have had um, uh, agreements with them now are, are, are wondering how many doses they're going to get. And I think Pfizer believes that by the end of next year, they can make a uh, it was something like 300 million doses and, and probably they're partnering with other companies and all that. And uh, uh, so this is an RNA vaccine. Uh, 
uh, which is brand new, never been licensed in humans before. So this is kind of interesting and, and, and all that at the same time. Um, the big deal with this RNA vaccine, unfortunately, is that it needs to be stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius. And most clinics don't have um, freezers that go that cold. Your, your standard freezer goes to minus 20. Um, so they have to figure out, you know, the cold chain and, the, and, and all that kind of thing. I think it could survive in a minus 20 freezer for five days, but you still have to have, uh, you know, stations set up where it's stored more permanently. So it'll be interesting to see where we go with this. Pfizer made that announcement. Of course, their stocks went way up and everyone's uh, super excited. Someone's asking why it was more effective for old people. We have no idea. Uh, you know, um, you're only looking at, a, a, you know, a couple, you know, less than a couple hundred people getting sick, right? And so at this stage, probably, uh, you know, we just don't have enough data to really say that for sure. That's just what the current data says. So until we get more data, uh, maybe that was just a little bit of a statistical fluke within the error, uh, margins of error kind of thing. So interestingly enough, Pfizer made their announcement. Everyone got really excited. Uh, lots of announcements from the Canadian government and other places that have uh, uh, given money to Pfizer. I think Dolly Parton was one of them, interestingly enough. Um, and then pretty much a week later, so this was three days ago, Moderna um, also made their announcement. And Moderna, interestingly enough, is also an RNA vaccine company. And so, like I said, these two companies, this is cutting edge, brand new technology. And kind of the advantage of this RNA technology is it's, it's, it's a lot easier to manufacture uh, than other vaccine types. Uh, Moderna's vaccine, I don't know what the difference is. They're saying theirs only needs to be stored at minus 20. Uh, so it's possible they may end up uh, uh, banking a little more buck from this whole thing uh, in the long run. Um, so this is encouraging, right? We have, we have some vaccines, uh, maybe even emergency use by the end of December in some areas. And uh, um, I think at this point, um, you know, other companies will, will probably make some announcements probably by the end of the year as well. So um, I think the real question about these vaccines is their longevity. And we don't know anything about the longevity of immunity to, um, uh, to this new virus. I think I mentioned before that some, some vaccines, you know, you're looking at uh, uh, you're good for 10 years, some you're good for longer, um, others uh, not so long. So this, the question now is, you know, is this going to be an annual thing like our flu shot? Is it going to be every five years? Uh, we don't know. It's going to take us, it's going to take us five to 10 years to figure this out. Um, you know, probably we'll have some answers within two years, um, but uh, at least there's some hope there. So interesting. So watch your news. There's lots of interesting microbiology in the news. You don't have to watch all the political stuff. There's uh, lots of better stuff out there. Okay, so I want to finish off this thing on vaccines and talk about polio. Um, this is something that I have found, um, you know, I, I don't know why, but it's something that I've found uh, uh, very interesting and, and uh, something that I've been following for many years um, because uh, we're trying to eradicate polio. So, We've eradicated uh, basically one human disease uh, worldwide, and that's smallpox. We've eradicated uh, a cattle disease called rinderpest as well. Uh, and, and so uh, the idea came in, you know, in the 1980s after we had eradicated smallpox. People said, well, you know, let's, let's work on polio, right? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about polio. It's a, it's a virus, it's an RNA virus. Uh, it's spread by the fecal oral route, so through human feces. And um, it will attach to uh, intestinal cells. And uh, polio is, is famous for, uh, oops, wrong way, uh, famous for causing paralysis in some people. And uh, if you talk to, if you, if you know somebody old in your life who remembers polio epidemics, I'm talking about way back to the 1940s and 50s, um, maybe not as much in the 60s because of the vaccine, but, uh, or, or maybe they remember their parents talking about it. Uh, and, and these were scary, right? We're talking about polio would come to your town and, and suddenly kids would start to get paralyzed, some adults. Uh, it, it was absolutely terrifying. Uh, and it would kind of happen every few years, right? So let, let me just talk a little bit about the uh, um, uh, pathology of polio. Uh, the majority of people are actually asymptomatic. And by asymptomatic, I mean they, they might actually have some gastrointestinal symptoms, right? So it is a, it is a virus that infects the gut. Um, but sometimes that virus will, you know, somehow, I'm not exactly sure the mechanism, but it gets out of the gut 
and gets into the blood and nerves, right? And that's where you might have some issues, right? So some people get, uh, uh, you know, some things like spasms and, and back pains. And uh, somewhere about 1% um, kind of ranges depending on the population, uh, but, you know, 0.5 to 2%, right? Uh, get paralytic polio. Uh, so that is, that is very scary. But, you know, you're looking at a disease now where about 1% of people are getting this scary thing. So it's a little bit harder to detect as some people have it. And, and they don't know it. Now, um, if you take a look at these numbers here, oh, by the way, here's somebody in an iron lung. Polio is also famous for having people in iron lungs, right? If you get paralyzed, you can't breathe. And uh, so sometimes you see these old movies and people in iron lungs and uh, it's helping them to breathe, right? And they were talking about resurrecting the iron lung with, um, uh, with COVID-19 with some people just uh, not being able to breathe, right? Uh, but I think there's newer, technologies now like these uh, ventilators and whatnot, but uh, they were talking about it, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so polio, terrifying. 1950s, uh, we were able to develop a vaccine for it. In fact, uh, there were a number of people working on the polio vaccine. And uh, uh, these two guys, Salk and Sabin, were at one point friends. I think they became bitter rivals or something. Uh, and of course, Salk uh, beat Sabin to the the vaccine punch and uh, basically he was using an inactivated polio vaccine. So that's an injectable uh, uh, vaccine. Sometimes people call it the salt vaccine uh, and uh, just kind of in the last few years we've sort of taken his name off of it because uh, you know when they're in, in inactivated or injectable um, you know at least people understand what's going on there right. Uh, 1960 so Sabine you know after the polio vaccine was out Sabine lost all his funding and believe it or not he went over to the Soviet Union and helped them uh, developed the oral polio vaccine and both have their uses. The oral polio vaccine is attenuated. So uh, probably all of you are young enough to have only gotten the injectable polio vaccine. I, of course, I don't know your ages, um, but I've had both. Uh, I had, uh, uh, I'm old enough, I remember in grade 10, I think it was, uh, I had the oral polio vaccine and that was kind of exciting because I knew I didn't have to get a shot. They just put a little uh, gel in your mouth and you swallow it and it's all good, right? Um, but we have switched in Canada to uh, only giving people the in, in, uh, injected uh, polio vaccine and I'll talk about why that is in a moment. So 1950s, uh, people were scared and they were lining their kids up. This is actually a trial, uh, but uh, you know, the polio vaccine was a big deal back then and I imagine the COVID-19 vaccine will be a big deal when uh, it, it pops out uh, hopefully next year. Um, there were all sorts of promotional things. There was Elvis getting his polio shot and, and uh, it made a huge difference. So I'll show you some numbers here in a moment. Here's a guy in an oil, uh, a guy in an iron lung posing for a, a photo of, uh, you know, the, uh, the polio vaccine. So let's take a look. 1988 was the Keystone year because this was the year they proposed we could maybe eradicate polio. So at this point here, um, a lot of uh, Western countries had either eradicated polio or mostly eradicated polio due to vaccination. And there were 350,000 cases approximately a year. That's 350,000 paralyzed people. Can you imagine? That is nuts uh, that we were actually living with that. Um, and, uh, and, and that means if you multiply that by 100, there, there were that many cases of actual polio, right? So, they said, hey, let's, let's do this, right? Let's start uh, rolling out this vaccine. And it turns out that the oral polio vaccine is super cheap to manufacture. We're talking about one dose is like a penny. I mean, we don't even use pennies anymore in Canada. That's how cheap they are. And there's still the, the price is that, is that low. And super easy to train people to give it. You just have to show people how to put something in someone else's mouth. There's no sterilization of needles. There's nothing like that. Super easy. So let's just give that to everybody was the idea, right? So uh, we, we did a great job. I can show you some numbers here in a moment, but um, 1994, the Americas, I mean, North and South America was declared polio free. And 1999, we uh, eradicated type two polio. Um, so that's great. There's three types. So that's like a third of the way there, I guess. Um, oh, okay. So 2002, you can see uh, like most of Asia, 
uh, you know, some parts are a little bit more difficult. India was just all, you know, India, that area is a little more difficult. Um, you can imagine uh, you've got uh, uh, like there's a billion or so people in India and uh, you could vaccinate everybody today and how many babies are going to be born tomorrow. It's just logistically a nightmare. Uh, India is just so many people. And then you've got poverty and things like that that make it a little bit harder to reach some of the regions and get everybody. They just have more concerns, right, than getting getting everything uh, vaccinated. But India actually is just an amazing, uh, you know, the way they've done it. Uh, um, uh, too, too long of a story to talk about right now, but India's done an amazing job. So you can see just in a few years, uh, they eliminated uh, the majority of the cases down to uh, about a couple thousand cases. And just, to, you know, just getting those harder parts of the world to reach, you know, India, Africa, lots of babies born. That's kind of a big deal, right? Um, so what makes polio a good candidate for eradication? Like, why don't we choose, let's say, malaria or something like that? Well, polio, there's two reasons why it makes a good candidate for eradication. A, we have a good vaccine. Actually, we have two good vaccines for polio, right? Um, so that's, that's great, right? Uh, polio just has three types. It's not like there's a thousand types. It doesn't mutate like, like the flu or anything like that. So actually, that's two reasons, right? It's a stable virus and we've got good vaccines. And the third reason is there's no animal uh, reservoir, right? It's not, uh, it's not around in bats in the wild or it's not in, in dogs or sheep or, or pigs or anything like that. It's only humans. So this is a good reason why we can um, maybe, uh, maybe eradicate polio. There's good reason why it's not a good candidate as well, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, someone's saying, what was B? Three reasons, good vaccine, a uh, stable virus that doesn't mutate uh, really very well. And number three, it, there's no animal reservoir. So 2012, getting a little bit closer, uh, you, we're looking at, uh, you know, good job India, right? Like, I mean, um, like I said, very difficult to get India. Um, some of these places, you can see Afghanistan, Nigeria, and Pakistan. So, uh, you know, Afghanistan uh, has been politically unstable for a long, long time. Um, so it's just hard to reach everybody there. Pakistan, you know, some of the same issues as India, but uh, generally a little, a little less uh, politically stable, um, but getting there. And uh, uh, Nigeria, um, you know, again, a very populous nation. And, um, you know, Africa uh, has had its own, own issues. There, were, there was a case where um, I think it was a couple of years they stopped vaccinating children due to uh, concerns over, over the safety. And that kind of put them behind about 10 years, unfortunately, for them. And then there were spillovers to neighboring countries and, and uh, you know, just a little bit, little, little more complex, right? Um, you know, if you see some of these, you know, if you're from Africa, you, you probably know, right? The roads and the transportation, um, it's just, just not as good as it could be, particularly in some regions, right? So skipping forward, why is polio eradication proving to be difficult? So like I said, we've got human reasons, right? We just, we have a lot of babies, uh, we have war, sometimes mistrust over vaccines. That was one of the cases that happened in Pakistan as well. Um, again, a long story about that. Um, but one of the other reasons that it's difficult to eradicate is that for every one case of polio, we probably have like, you know, 98, 99 other cases of people that are asymptomatic. So this is a big deal, right? How do we wipe it out if there's a lot of invisible cases going on, right? And the strategy is really just to, to vaccinate everybody and, uh, and, and keep getting people to vaccinate their babies until we can get rid of this whole thing. Um, there's another reason why it's difficult to eradicate, and I'll talk about that in a moment with one of these other maps, but just getting a little closer, you can see we're 223 cases in, in 2012. That's, that's pretty good. Um, so 2012, uh, type 3 polio is believed to be eradicated. So that means we just have type 1 left over. That's great. Uh, India was declared uh, polio-free in 2014. You have to have no cases for three years before the World Health Organization will declare you polio-free. Uh, 2015, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, were the holdouts and no cases in Africa. So great, good job, uh, you know, Nigeria in particular. Um, so you can see polio-3 was uh, uh, officially declared eradicated last year. I forgot about that. And then uh, just this year, 
uh, Africa who was, was declared uh, free of wild polio. So this is awesome. It makes me so excited to see this kind of thing, right? Um, like I said, it's not as, uh, not as simple as, as you might think. So here's, here's the current state. I think I looked this up about a week or two ago. Um, the map is, is a little less recent. Is that we have wild polio in Pakistan, Af Afghanistan, and we still have some places in the world where we're getting vaccine-derived polio. Um, so what is that? This is another issue with polio and something that I really wish we could do so much better. We could replace our old vaccines with new ones. We have the technology to do it. It just costs a lot of money to do so. And I think actually Bill Gates has put money towards that. So good job, Bill. Um, but the problem with the classical uh, uh, Sabine vaccine is that once in a while, and this is super rare, maybe one in a million or one in two million or something like that, the vaccine virus, like I said, it's an attenuated vaccine, can actually mutate. And it can mutate back to the type that will actually give you disease. And this is very, very rare. Like I said, one in a million, one in two million. But then let's think about it. How many people are in Nigeria right now, right? I mean, there are millions of people there and everyone, so it's gonna happen, right? It's gonna happen and that mutation is gonna, is gonna occur, right? Uh, I think the population of Nigeria, what is it, something like 50 million? Could be more. I'm not sure. I just know it's more than Canada. Um, yeah, so you're vaccinating a lot of people there, and once in a while that mutation is going to happen. So what we're trying to do now in some of these countries where polio has been eradicated, we're switching to the injectable killed vaccine where that won't happen. And that's one of the motivations why Canada did so about 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully we'll make some progress. Unfortunately, with the COVID-19 pandemic, this uh, may have put, put these vaccination efforts behind uh, a few years, but um, you know, it would be nice to, to see the end of polio and uh, you know, something that probably none of you have ever seen and, and will hopefully never see in your lifetime. And uh, that would be awesome. Okay, so I want to just finish off this topic and talk about our vaccine wish list, things that we would love to have. So you probably know that number one on this list, of course, is a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Everyone wants life to be back to normal, whatever that will be after this. <laughs> Lots of debates on that. Um, but a few other things that would be nice. We would love to have a universal flu vaccine. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, like, why do, you know, it would just be great if we didn't have to get that flu shot every year. Uh, and, and We've actually done this, I think, in mice and llamas. Um, for some reason, we can't do the same thing in humans yet, uh, but that would be nice. Um, what about an MRSA vaccine? Uh, there are people working on it. I don't really know what the logistical uh, issues are, but uh, if we could, if we could uh, have an MRSA vaccine, that would be great. Of course, um, some of the big areas of development are what we call the major scourges of the developing world. So HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. All of these things have had uh, lots of money poured into these projects to try to uh, uh, solve these issues. And uh, they all have their own particularities, which I can't, don't have time to get into. But it'd be great if we could have uh, reliable vaccines for these things. And then just in general, parasites and fungal infections, there's, there's certain things that we'd also love to have. And this is kind of uh, hits a lot of these lists where people say, you know, what about this and what about that? And often it's some sort of parasite or fungal infection. That's, it's not as common here, but maybe in other countries. So somebody's mentioning a vaccine for cancers. That's actually on my next slide, uh, which I call the future of vaccines. So we're kind of at a point where we're actually um, starting to find vaccines for other things, right? Um, so cancer vaccines are preventative, a lot of, uh, right, a therapeutic, right? Most vaccines are preventative. We're hoping to not get measles or not get something else. So we are, uh, there are several cancer vaccines that are approved, uh, many kind of in trials. I was reading one of the news about a breast cancer vaccine that was being tested uh, somewhere. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's kind of cool. Uh, there are people that are working on Alzheimer's vaccines. I have no idea how this works, right? Uh, but uh, you know, that, that would be amazing, right? I mean, if you, if you are lucky enough to live to age 70 or 80, uh, your chances of, um, of dementia, you know, start to increase dramatically. And if we could do something, that would be cool. Something else I was reading about was uh, a trial uh, using uh, vaccines to treat addictions. And uh, 
apparently uh, there have been some successful trials on this too. I, I don't know the whole story, but the whole idea is that uh, uh, people are giving vaccine and then they don't get high. And so they keep taking the drug and they just stop using the drug because they're not getting high anymore. Um, so kind of a cool idea. Um, we'll see if these things, you know, eventually materialize because that was a few years ago. I remember reading about that. But apparently they're testing them. Okay, so I'm a little bit longer than I'd hoped, but like I said, I find this stuff super fascinating and very exciting. Uh, uh, all the potential here. Uh, so that is the end of topic 13-2. And uh, so we're going to switch gears now. And I am going to uh, talk about 13-3. So let me just get that screen up here. Okay, screen sharing, there we go. So topic 13-3 is on immune disorders and HIV and AIDS. So also something that's quite uh, fascinating. And, and so some of these things, um, just gonna warn you now, I'm gonna probably go through a couple of things pretty quickly, try to point out what I think is uh, kind of the important stuff to know for the exam. Uh, all these things, obviously we can delve in uh, a lot deeper if we wanted to. Uh, but you know, especially uh, uh, the first part here where I'm mostly just gonna give you some examples of, of some various things. So what do we mean by immune disorders? There's kind of two categories or two general categories. One is hypersensitivities. So by that we mean uh, where the immune system is a little too excited, a little too reactive and causing discomfort or damage to the body. Second part, immunodeficiencies, which is kind of the opposite, where the immune system isn't working as well as it should. So it's suppressed or it's failed or something like that. So I've got lots of examples of both of these. So let's just get into this. The first group are the hypersensitivities. And uh, there's technically four types. Now, I do not expect you to learn all four types. Uh, I'm just showing you this to say that there are four types and they all have uh, kind of different mechanisms behind them right, in terms of what cells are being activated and what, uh, what messengers, and sometimes some of them are fast and some of these are slower reactions and those kind of things. So mostly I just want you to know the examples and that these examples are hypersensitivities, okay? Um, I'm not gonna ask you, you know, an example of an immune complex mediated hypersensitivity, for example, but I might ask you for examples of immune hypersensitivities or something like that, right? So let's, I'm gonna have a slide or two about each of these, a little bit more about allergies. Uh, allergy is something um, that I have experienced and uh, for some reason I've been lucky enough when I moved to Alberta most of my allergies kind of vanished so whatever was floating around in the air in Ontario uh, doesn't seem to be out here so good job Alberta thank you <laughs> um, but once in a while they do flare up so what is an allergy an allergy is a hypersensitivity right and so this is uh, where the immune system is uh, is reacting to something that uh, usually most people don't react to, right? And that thing that we're reacting to is called an allergen. So um, be a little bit more technical. Um, it's a local or systemic reaction uh, and uh, it's involving histamines. And there's a whole bunch of different types of things that fall into the category of allergic diseases. So this includes uh, food allergies, eczema, asthma, uh, hay fever, uh, anaphylaxis, you can see on, the, on that list there. Um, I see someone made a comment about, about uh, her allergies getting worse. Moving to Alberta, yeah, you're not the only one. Uh, my friend's uh, son, they found out he's allergic to birch pollen, and guess what? There's a lot of birch trees around here. Poor kid. So uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about some um, uh, allergies here. Uh, you're probably familiar with some of them. It seems everybody knows somebody or has an allergy or asthma or something like that. Um, we can kind of classify them into different categories. Not really going to go into that too much. You can kind of think of them, I sort of think of them in two categories, environmental allergens, so things that you're going to encounter out and about. So, you know, dust is kind of one of the common ones, but pests and pollens and, and those kind of things. And then, of course, the other one that people talk about a lot is, of course, food allergies, because people are wondering whether they can send their child to school with a peanut butter sandwich or not, or or whether to have peanut butter even in the house, right? So the um, 
The allergen is basically the antigen that causes the allergic reaction. That's the thing that we're reacting to. So with peanuts, for example, it's a certain protein that's found uh, on the peanut, right? And that's what the, that's what the body is reacting to. So um, I, I found this data. I just I can't stop thinking about allergies. There's so much interesting data out there. This is showing uh, uh, food allergies amongst Canadian children, and you can see that. Uh, I was I always wondered what this number was for peanut allergies in particular, 2.4% uh, of children. So that's, that's a lot. I had no idea. Okay, so what's going on with the allergen, right? So you have to be like any immune reaction to be strong. You have to be exposed to it. And we know this is for, this is for sure. There's tons of studies that show this kind of thing. You can see here we have an IgE antibody, right? So I mentioned before that these are involved in attacking parasitic worms but they're also involved in allergies. Um, and, you know, there's, there's lots of hypotheses around this, but there's a lot that we don't understand. But you can see it's being sensitized, right, by being exposed to that thing. So it means that you're not born with a peanut allergy. You're not born with any allergies. You have to be exposed to it somehow. And uh, lots I could say about this, but again, not, not enough time to really get into all the details about this. But I'll just say, uh, you know, the classic experiment is actually East and West Germany. Uh, and peanut allergies are common in, in West Germany back in the day uh, when there was a, a wall between East and West Germany and not common in East Germany. And that's because they didn't have peanut butter in East Germany. And so kids weren't getting exposed and not getting an allergy. So you can see that you've got a, 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 cell, a cell that gets sensitized, right? And, uh, and then of course, you know, it's gonna form memory cells and, uh, and in the future, when the person exposed to the allergen, uh, it's going to release um, these uh, eosinophils, they release histamines. And, uh, and then, of course, the histamines are causing all sorts of problems. And, and uh, depending on you know, where the histamines are released, it could be local problems. So it could be a runny nose or sneezing or itchy eyeballs or itchy skin or, or maybe a scratchy throat. Um, or it could be a lot more serious, right? If the, hist if the uh, histamines are released a little bit more systemically, maybe you'll have problems um, uh, breathing, right? So see somebody has a comment about, yeah, that's why they want you to expose kids to, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, that's part of it too, right? Uh, so like I said, there's a lot that, that we could say about that, but certainly, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the, the, the wisdom was don't expose your kids to peanut butter until they're at least a year or two. Um, now they're seeing the exact opposite. Again, it's the research is showing that uh, early exposure desensitizes you um, to it. Uh, um, whereas, whereas kids that are, that, sorry, I, I just, there's too much I could get into. I need to move on. But yeah, early exposure uh, in large quantities actually desensitizes somebody to it. Small quantities early on can actually sensitize somebody to an allergy. So basically we have these histamines causing us a bunch of problems, right? And uh, of course that's no fun. So how do we alleviate our allergies? We can avoid the allergen. We can use antihistamines. So antihistamines, you can see there's our histamines. They're binding all these receptors and causing the inflammation. And uh, well, the antihistamines are basically drugs that block the histamines from binding the receptors. And there's a whole bunch out there nowadays. Uh, it's really hard to keep track of all the antihistamines, probably hundreds of types. Uh, Benadryl is kind of one of the older classical ones. Uh, I think they're sort of uh, kind of not recommending people take Benadryl as much anymore because of the side effects. Uh, a lot of the newer ones have less side effects, such as drowsiness, and I'm not sure what all the side effects are. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. And the last, uh, last symptom you can relieve sometimes is using uh, epinephrine. So what's that? That's like what's in an EpiPen. And that's basically uh, adrenaline, and it's going to help someone to breathe. So an EpiPen is kind of like a a short-term solution to help the person breathe until you get them to emergency, until you get them the uh, antihistamines. So I kind of just want to finish off and talk about where do allergies come from. Um, you know, this is, this is, there's a matter of debate around this. Um, and, and all these things here I have here have some, uh, some basis to them. There's definitely a genetic basis. Allergies definitely run in families. And particularly if you look at identical twins, they're more likely to have allergies. Uh, than fraternal twins and, and, and siblings and those kind of things, right? If your parents had allergies or asthma, you're, you're likely to have allergies or asthma or eczema or something like that, right? I look at my family, I have a son with a peanut allergy. I have a nephew with a peanut allergy. I have another nephew with a pistachio allergy. Uh, so definitely something running in the family here, right? 
Uh, my mother had asthma, my grandfather had asthma, you know, those kind of things, right? So you definitely see these things um, uh, running in the family, right? I think my brother actually had some severe allergies when he was young that he grew out of. I don't know the whole story on that because he's older than me, but I should ask him sometime. Uh, sensitization, definitely as well. Um, I'll tell you a story. I uh, had a neighbor years ago who was allergic to carrots and like I laughed, like that's funny. Who's allergic to carrots, right? I mean, anyway, so and then and he said, well, I used to work at a, a carrot factory. And so it totally makes sense, right? Uh, you're you're uh, dealing with carrots. Um, probably in some case you got, you know, maybe you got some under the skin and into the blood where the immune cells are. And of course, you know, eventually he got sensitized to it. So big one that we're talking about nowadays is something called the hygiene hypothesis. Um, maybe I'll just say other environmental factors. There's probably other things out there that are sensitizing us, but you know, we have so many chemicals out there, who knows what they're doing. Uh, let me talk about the hygiene hypothesis though. The hygiene hypothesis is this idea that our immune systems uh, are not, uh, they're just not getting used as much because everything is so clean and sterile. And, and particularly that part of the immune system, those IgE antibodies and those eosinophil cells, uh, you know, they're kind of like trained soldiers just sitting around with loaded weapons waiting to, to go off. And when we're not getting exposed to parasitic worms, um, then, you know, they, they just need to act on something. And so for some reason, uh, some of these allergens, you know, why peanuts, why shellfish, uh, you know, there's some, some debate about that, why those things seem to be good allergens. Um, there's a lot of research behind this. Uh, if you look at farmers, uh, farmers have less allergies than city folk. Uh, if you look at people who uh, uh, lived in a, a developing country where they may have been exposed to parasitic worms, uh, usually they don't have allergies, but then they may immigrate to a place like Canada and their children have allergies. Uh, so you can see all these things. Like I said, there's a huge body of research to kind of support this. And I have one um, kind of interesting story to tell you about a guy who, uh, uh, had extreme allergies and this guy was featured on a couple of TV shows and uh, apparently his allergies were so bad he had to keep like he quit his jobs like he just couldn't work um, and and so uh, he had read about this connection of worms and allergies and he went um, over to Cameroon and, uh, and and literally walked around in latrine areas which is just like kind of nuts but remember how hookworm works it actually will burrow through your skin and he, he got a successful hookworm infection. Now, I don't recommend this, right? If you were to choose any one worm, I don't know if I'd choose hookworm. Uh, hookworm can give you anemia and a few other issues. Apparently he's, he can, apparently he's treating it with taking iron supplements. I don't know, I don't know the full story here. I, I've only read about it I, uh, a little bit. Um, and apparently now he's selling hookworms over the internet and I don't think that's legal. <laughs> but uh, uh, like I said, I don't know the end of this story. Um, but uh, it works and there's lots of cases where people have had this kind of thing happen where they exit, you know, they, they have these extreme allergies, they do some traveling, um, they get worm infections and, uh, and then the allergies go away. And uh, so there's definitely something connected with these parts of the immune system. Um, usually though, once the uh, worms are treated and they go away, the allergies come back, unfortunately. But maybe someday, maybe someday we'll have a way to, uh, you know, maybe we'll harvest proteins from these worms and there'll be supplements people can take or something like that, uh, that will um, alleviate allergies. Um, who knows? But I think it's an interesting uh, place of research. Um, yeah, so I think the bottom line is, um, you know, should you let your kid play in the dirt and pick his nose and, and whatnot? Um, yeah, a little bit of that's probably not too bad for him. So uh, yeah, I think that's where we're at in, in society, isn't it? So anyway, uh, you know, don't take that as, as pure medical advice, but just, uh, you know, my suggestion as a, as a parent that uh, a little bit of dirt is not, not bad for your child. Uh, okay, so what about these other hypersensitivities? Uh, like I said, there's a whole bunch of these and they're classified in different ways, kind of depending on their mechanisms. So the allergies, of course, are eosinophils and the, and the IgE um, antibodies. Um, the cytotoxic hypersensitivities, uh, th this is uh, where your body is recognizing something uh, as, as non-self and, uh, and it reacts immediately. So 
A good example of this is if you were to get the wrong blood type in a blood transfusion, your immune system would go nuts and it, would, it could be lethal, right, if, if you get too much blood. And you can see basically those antibodies are binding, they're recognizing an antigen, it's not your antigen because it's the wrong blood type, and then the immune system goes ballistic. Some other examples there, you can see hemolytic uh, disease of newborn, hemolytic anemia uh, as well, where blood cells are also being attacked. Type three is the immune complex hypersensitivity. So this is where we have these immune complexes remain. So by that, I mean an antigen antibody complex and they get trapped in, um, in tissues. And kind of the most common one is of course, rheumatoid arthritis. So what you have is an antigen, it's trapped in, in a tissue, a joint, and the immune system is going in there and causing uh, collateral damage, which is damaging those joints and causing the arthritis to get worse. And it kind of gets worse and worse and worse. Someone's asking, how would you stop or counteract the reaction to the wrong blood type? I have no idea. Um, I don't know if there would be an antibody treatment for that, kind of like the anti-venom. Um, yeah, no idea. Good question. Uh, you can see lupus, farmer's lung is another one. Uh, so let's just take a look at rheumatoid arthritis. I think I've got a picture here kind of showing uh, what's going on in the textbook. You can see we've got an immune cell, we've got an antibody, we've got a little bit of tissue damage. And uh, um, see, this is not the uh, diagram I thought it was here. Uh, it's showing some of the same stuff. I had a, I had a better diagram. I wonder what happened to that. Uh, but basically, like I said, you've got some immune uh, complexes forming. And then you've got these, uh, the damage is just, it just keeps happening. It's, it gets cyclic. These, uh, these B cells release more antibodies and more immune uh, damage. And, and uh, you know, once it kind of happens, it's hard to, I don't think it's reversible at all either, unfortunately. So here's a picture of someone with a rheumatoid arthritis. It can get very uh, extreme. This is actually a cartoon. Um, and the pictures, believe it or not, were a little too graphic for me. I really had a hard time looking at them. Um, but you can see this person's joints are, are really getting a pummeling from the, uh, from the tissue damage. Here's some x-rays. You can see a normal hand with a rheumatoid arthritis hand. Uh, obviously, this is a pretty extreme case, but you can imagine uh, some of the difficulties a person would have with this kind of arthritis. Just doing simple tasks like uh, doing a button or a zipper or something like that. So type four um, is kind of a big group. Uh, these are cell mediated hypersensitivities and there's a whole bunch of these out here that have been kind of making the rounds as uh, um, uh, lots of people announcing they have them, Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis and type one diabetes. And uh, this, I'm not really sure why it's more of a delayed reaction. Uh, these are kind of things that don't necessarily onset right away. So you might know people with uh, multiple sclerosis or, or type one diabetes, they can live uh, normally sometimes for decades. And then suddenly there's this uh, quick onset and then their, their condition deteriorates quickly. Um, if you've had the TB skin test, and I think all the nursing students still get it, uh, you know, they, they call you back a day or two later to take a look and see if you've, um, if you've reacted, right? And uh, so like I said, there's a whole bunch of these out here uh, and, and these are just some examples. And, uh, and the main thing to know is that they are hypersensitivities. Uh, that's what you need to know for the test. So know some examples of hypersensitivities. So kind of the last part of this is I just wanted to mention that there's an uh, interesting body of research connecting infectious disease, infectious organisms with some of these autoimmune diseases. Um, you can see I call this equations that spell disaster. That's from a, an article I read that was talking about this. And we've known, for example, for, for decades now that this particular uh, virus, um, I'm not sure what it's called, uh, Ekendi virus, uh, is associated with type 1 diabetes. And so this is kind of what we think is going on is that you, you have type one diabetes. So you have, a, um, you know, the genetic predisposition to it. And, uh, and that somehow maybe this infection sort of accelerates your, uh, your progression of diabetes. Um, and there's an indication too that uh, there's that some gut bacteria may be associated with multiple sclerosis um, and so on. And so the, the really interesting body of research sort of indicating this. Um, still, Lots of question marks, um, but you know, all these types of diseases, like I said, they seem to often just sort of pop up a uh, person living quite normally for quite some time and then suddenly uh, things just get a lot worse. And um, 
So like I said, it might have something to do with these infections accelerating the immune response against your own body. All right, part two of this, we're gonna talk about immunodeficiencies. And we can break these into two types of immunodeficiencies. Primary, meaning you, um, it's just part of your genes. And acquired means you get it somewhere else. So primary immunodeficiencies, um, like I said, it's, it's you're born with it, right? And uh, it turns out there's a whole bunch of these out there. You probably, uh, you know, probably many of us have some primary immunodeficiencies. Um, there's a whole bunch, right? And, and, and usually what it means is that your body, uh, you know, it doesn't make a certain type of, uh, uh, of antibody or, or there's something wrong with one of your cytokines that it doesn't communicate as well or, or, or something like that, right? And most of these immunodeficiencies, we have no idea because our immune system has so much, so many things going on. It's got B cells, it's got T cells, it's got innate immunity, and, and usually there's all these overlapping in protection. So sometimes if you're missing something, uh, we don't even know because the, the immune system just compensates by using another area. It might mean you're, you're slightly more susceptible to getting certain types of infections, right? Maybe you get, uh, maybe you get uh, the common cold a little bit more often because of, uh, you know, some little tweak in your genetics. So usually it's not such a big deal. There are some immunodeficiencies that are much more serious. This is maybe the most famous one. It's called SCID um, or bubble boy disease sometimes it's called. And uh, in this case here, uh, these uh, uh, children uh, lack the ability to produce lymphocytes entirely. So they really have no immune system whatsoever. Uh, one of the more famous cases was this one here, David Vetter, and he was called The Bubble Boy, and there were at least a couple of documentaries and movies done from him, and he was basically kept in a sterile environment. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of rough life, right? Um, but yeah, it, he had no immune system, so even like a hug or a kiss from his mom could have been, could have been fatal, which is kind of sad. Um, interestingly enough, there was a, a movie uh, done, uh, The Boy in the Plastic Bubble. Um, I've never seen this movie, but my sister has talked about it once or twice. I think my sister is in love with uh, John Travolta, um, or at least has a serious crush on him. So, you know, anything that this guy puts out, she's, she's seen for sure. But uh, yeah, I don't know a ton about it, but I know it's uh, certainly not a desirable thing to have. So I wanna talk more about uh, HIV and AIDS, which is gonna be mostly the focus of the rest of the lecture. Uh, and, uh, um, but there are other types of acquired immunodeficiencies, right? Uh, sometimes people are malnourished, and of course that is not good for your immune system. Uh, you know, sometimes your immune system gets uh, ragged and, and uh, run down when you get old, or if you have other treatments going on, um, you know, uh, some sort of chemotherapy. And, uh, and then certain infections. So measles, for example, is very good at knocking out your immune system. Measles will actually kill memory cells. So that's bad, right? If you get measles, um, yeah, you, uh, you could have been immune to a whole bunch of things that you're no longer immune to anymore. Uh, so very, very serious disease. Uh, much more serious, of course, is HIV, which can kill T lymphocytes and, uh, and uh, is not really, uh, there's not really a cure for it either, right? So let's talk about HIV and AIDS. So what is AIDS, right? AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So if you have HIV, you don't necessarily have AIDS. AIDS is where your immune system is down to a certain point, and you can see that there's kind of a clinical definition of it, which, which is I sort of have there, not fully, but uh, we're looking at a decrease in a certain type of uh, T cells and the presence of the virus. So there's a clinical definition we'll look at in a minute, but you can see it's also associated with certain symptoms and diseases as well. And we'll get into that, uh, that shortly here. Uh, what kind of symptoms are we talking about? And uh, we're talking about things like shingles, uh, disseminated herpes, rare cancers, rare fungal infections, uh, uh, rare respiratory infections. There's kind of a big list of them that don't usually pop up in healthy individuals and uh, are more associated with people with a broken down immune system. So generally, uh, if you have HIV and if you don't get treatment, then uh, the infection usually progresses to AIDS. Uh, that's kind of the, uh, the general um, uh, way it is. But like I said, not everyone with HIV gets AIDS because we do have treatments for it now. Um, 
not cures, but uh, treatments that people would take and uh, would keep the virus down to a low level. I see someone has a comment about a friend with a full stem cell transplant. Ouch, yeah, and uh, yeah, basically it's like, okay, they wipe out their, wipe out your whole immune system and, and need to, uh, uh, need to reestablish uh, all your memory cells. Yeah, that kind of thing definitely happens with uh, that kind of treatment. So diseases associated with AIDS, I, I don't want to talk about these. So disseminated herpes or shingles. Um, so uh, we talked about these herpes viruses, right? We all have tons um, of, uh, of uh, herpes viruses out there. So a bunch of us probably have uh, herpes simplex one or two. So I think that's about 60% of us. Um, and, and usually not causing too many problems, sometimes some painful blisters. Um, many of us, uh, before the vaccine came out, have also had uh, chicken pox. So now you also have a, a herpes virus. And, and these are lifelong infections and they're hiding uh, in various parts of the body. And uh, the immune system is keeping them at bay. But when the immune system starts to fail, um, that's a problem, right? The virus can reemerge and it can cause something called the disseminated herpes in their shingles, which means it's spreading to all sorts of uh, body parts that we don't necessarily see these. Uh, these viruses flourishing in. So that's a pretty extreme case there, that picture, I believe. Um, some rare cancers, you can see here's a cancer of the blood vessels, uh, things that people aren't normally getting uh, that our immune system normally is keeping at bay. Um, different types of pneumonias, pneumocytis, that's a, that's a fungal type of pneumonia that most of us just don't get because our immune system fights it off. Um, geographically, uh, it might be tuberculosis. So um, if you are living in Africa and you are diagnosed with tuberculosis, one of the very next things they do is test you for HIV. Uh, and that's kind of the way it is. In North America, that's not the case. We just don't have tuberculosis as, as much as common over here. And you can see thrush as well. So thrush common in babies that don't have a good flora, also common in people whose immune system is kind of, you know, all out of, uh, all out of sorts. So there's a whole list of these diseases. These are just some of the common ones. Somebody has a question about when it's actually classified as AIDS. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So we talked about the HIV virus. Uh, there it is, just a reminder of what it looks like. It's got uh, two strands of RNA. It's got these uh, glycoproteins on the surface. And uh, this, uh, this one here, GP120, that's glycoprotein number 120. That's actually its molecular mass, 120,000 grams per mole. And this is what is attaching to something called a CD4 receptor. So this is on, uh, on T lymphocytes, these uh, helper cells. And uh, so you'll see that, uh, that GP120 and that CD4 mentioned here in a moment. So here it goes, it's infecting a cell. I'm just gonna go through the life cycle quickly. Um, you can see that GP120 is, is attaching to the CD4. And then that causes the, uh, the, the uh, virus envelope to fuse with the host membrane and that's going to release the, uh, the capsid part of the, uh, of the virus inside the cell. So once it gets inside the cell, you can see there it is there. Uh, the, uh, the capsid actually, once it gets into the cytoplasm, it actually dissolves. And, uh, and then that's where the reverse transcriptase that we've been talking about comes in. So reverse transcriptase is listed there. And you can see it's taking the viral RNA and it's making double-stranded uh, DNA. So that DNA is gonna go into the uh, nucleus and it gets integrated. Remember the second enzyme was integrase and it becomes a provirus. So it's hiding in that cell and becomes a lifelong infection. So at some point that gene gets activated uh, or gene, I mean the viral DNA gets activated and it's gonna start producing uh, virus RNA and then eventually uh, viral proteins. And you can see over here, these proteins are being made. And the last step is the assembly, uh, and they're gonna bud from the cells. And there is one more step that's not shown on this. This is from the textbook, uh, the step where the protease actually matures those proteins, and that actually happens after the budding. So I'm not gonna show you the video again. You can take a look at that uh, if you want to re refresh yourself on the uh, HIV life cycle. So as I mentioned, uh, untreated, uh, we're looking at uh, AIDS eventually developing. And um, so, and this is because, of course, uh, this is attacking uh, T lymphocytes. And without those T lymphocytes, we're looking at a crippling part of our immune system. And in fact, um, 
those T helper cells do interact with both B cells and other T cells as part of the regulatory process. Someone is asking, should we know the lifestyle, uh, life cycle steps? Um, a little bit. You should know the key enzymes, right? Kind of some of the key points there. Uh, the reverse, transcript, uh, reverse transcriptase is important, um, but I'm not gonna ask you probably about the life cycle other than, other than reverse transcriptase. I think I did that on the first midterm. So um, epidemiology of HIV. So if someone gets infected and the virus replicates, you can see that it uh, uh, congregates in uh, different types of fluids. So you can see the cerebrospinal fluid, which is not really a concern. People usually don't infect each other by them. And same thing with intestinal secretions. That's not usually um, going in contact with other people. Kind of the two main parts of contact with other individuals is our blood and semen. And uh, so, of course, uh, that means that uh, for the most part, most infection is going to be through uh, uh, blood contact or uh, seminal fluid contact, right? And uh, so we'll talk about that transmission. And, uh, there is some in earwax, apparently, and breast milk. And so, uh, you know, there is, there is some risk with, uh, with breastfeeding, uh, apparently. Um, but I, I don't know what the risk is and whether they recommend it or not. Uh, but uh, it, it is found in breast milk in very small concentrations. And apparently saliva, which uh, uh, I don't know what the risk of kissing someone is, but I thought from my understanding is very, very low. So transmission, what are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, basically, uh, for the most part, sex and drugs. Uh, childbirth, of course, being the other, other risk as well. So uh, if you take a look, I've got this chart here that shows uh, kind of there's some differences between males and females in terms of the uh, kind of primary uh, ways that HIV is spread. So for females, uh, the majority of HIV transmission is through heterosexual contact with kind of uh, um, injection drug use being the other big part of that, that wedge. Uh, for males, um, the majority is actually male to male sexual contact and uh, with heterosexual contact and injection drug use being part of that formula as well. So it's always interesting to see that. Um, you know, uh, I'll tell you a quick story here. Uh, why, you know, in some ways you think this would be so easy to, to deal with, but um, I'll tell you this quick story. Um, this was told by an epidemiologist uh, podcast I was listening to, and she's talking about working in a prison and uh, talking about this guy who is HIV positive. And, uh, and, and she's talking to him and he said, he was telling her this story about how one day uh, someone, uh, it was their birthday and they had smuggled some heroin into the prison and uh, they were gonna share it. And so there he was with like, you know, eight guys and, um, you know, watching uh, the needle get passed around, right? So the first guy got some heroin and then, you know, he injected himself and wiped it off on, on his shirt, the needle, and passed it to the next guy. And he's looking and he's like number five in line to get some heroin. And, and he said, you know, it was kind of insane how, how like part of his brain was thinking, oh crap, I, I could get HIV from this, right? And eventually he did. Uh, he didn't probably at that point. But then he said an even bigger part of his brain was saying, boy, I hope there's enough heroin for me. And so you can see, like, when it comes to sex and drugs, right, people don't think clearly, right? Uh, that, and that's just, that's part of, you know, I guess what it means to be human, right? Uh, and this is an area where we don't think clearly. So, um, you know, it, it's really important to educate people. And hopefully, you know, I think we can always do better in these areas. So I want to talk a little bit about the progression of the disease and what's going on with the virus in general. So if you take a look at this, uh, this is showing the viral load, right? So how much virus is in the blood? Uh, what is it? Copies per mil of blood plasma, right? So you can see uh, right during infection, so right at the very beginning, within the first few weeks, you can see there's a big spike, right? The virus, uh, it gets in there and um, it starts replicating and boom, the viral load is really high. And uh, at this point, people get a lot of kind of typical sort of viremia sort of symptoms. So sometimes a fever. Um, this, is, this is multiplying in the lymph tissue. So it's going to look a lot like mono where people are going to get um, some fever, fatigue, uh, and swollen lymph nodes, those kind of things. 
And, uh, and this is the most dangerous part of an HIV infection because the viral load is high and the person is quite healthy and they probably don't know that they have it and they may actually transmit it to other people. Uh, so because the viral load is so high. Eventually though, after several weeks, um, the immune system does mount a response against the virus. So you can see it dips down here and then it's kind of at this low level. It's not like undetectable low, but close. It's actually very hard to detect at those levels. And uh, the person is, um, their infectiveness is actually a lot lower. Now, again, with sex and drugs, of course, um, you, you know, if you, if you have intercourse with someone with HIV and the, the viral load is very low, the risk is very low. But then if you're living with that person and, uh, and of course, you know, that's a repeat thing, you know, if the, if the, if the, if the chance is, you know, one in 200 and you live with the person for several years, and then the chance of getting infected, of course, is, you know, is very likely to happen eventually. Um, the virus is multiplying at this point and slowly killing off those T helper cells, slowly, slowly, and it takes uh, an average of eight years. Some people it's a little quicker, some people it's a little shorter, but eventually there's a point where those uh, T helper cells, uh, there's just not a lot of them left. And the virus is able to kind of get out of control again. And you can see here at the very end, the virus uh, titer goes high, and this is usually where somebody actually has, uh, has AIDS. So I wanna talk a little bit about the disease here. I know I have another chart here coming up uh, here in a moment. Um, I guess I've got a couple slides to go. I wanna show you this as well. This is kind of interesting um, about, uh, uh, about what is going on. You can see this is, it says USA, uh, but it means most, uh, most Western countries um, where, uh, you know, we're looking at sex and drugs, uh, obviously, uh, for males, uh, particularly uh, males who are engaged in male-to-male -male sexual contact are, are, are at high risk. And so in terms of the epidemiology, uh, you know, this, this is one population that, uh, you know, a lot of the education is targeted towards. And of course, intravenous drug users as well. So there's programs, you know, condom programs and needle exchange programs and those kind of things are, are targeted towards the high-risk populations. I want to show you this, though is that uh, something that people don't realize is that worldwide, um, most of the transmission of HIV is uh, due to heterosexual contact. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of something else to think about, right? Uh, in that, uh, you know, there's, um, there's lots of vulnerable or people who, who don't have all the information in front of them. And, um, and it's very, very, very complex. I wanted to show you this uh, one model I was reading about. Um, uh, that kind of talks about this here. And uh, I guess I'll show you this map. I think I mentioned this map way back in topic six and said I'd come back to it. And we've got uh, some parts of the world are just higher uh, risk and higher prevalence. You can see some of these countries in red, uh, you know, 10% um, of the population affected. That's insane. So what's going on here? So I want to talk about um, this model. And uh, it's something that, uh, uh, um, it is worth taking, you know, seriously and, in, in, you know, in terms of trying to prevent the infection. So um, if you take a look at this model, you know, what is going on between, let's say, the average Canadian and the average, uh, let's say, people in, uh, uh, let's pick on South Africa. Uh, and if you're from South Africa, I apologize. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm talking about you, and I'll get to that example in a moment. But let's talk about Canada first, right? So in Canada, typically, when people are in relationships, um, it's more of a monogamy or at least a serial monogamy relationship. So what does that mean? It means you usually have one partner and that's it. And, uh, and then maybe you eventually break up and, and then you find another partner, right? Um, but usually you're only, you're only dealing with one person at a time. So if you take a look here, here's someone who's infected, this little red dot here. And uh, so this is a, a male and uh, he gets infected somehow and then might infect his, uh, his spouse. And, uh, and, and that's kind of, you know, usually at that point they, they you know, have some symptoms and, and they might realize they're HIV positive and, and that's the end of the, the chain. And hopefully if they break up and find other partners, they're going to be responsible about it. Um, not always the case, but generally that's, that's kind, of the, kind of the end, right? So the other model is concurrency. And I'm picking on South Africa because um, about, I think it's about 10% of the population is involved in something called concurrent relationships. 
Uh, a lot of this is um, uh, been documented in the migrant worker population. So South Africa is kind of like Fort McMurray, it's a mining place, right? And you've got people from all over the place uh, that come there uh, and, uh, and they're involved in, in mining. And uh, a high percentage, so like I said, uh, about 10% of the population sort of fits into this category. Uh, many, of, uh, very, many of them are, are these migrant workers where they, they may have concurrent relationships. So maybe they have a wife back home and they decide to have a girlfriend or two because they're, well, they're away from home for four years. Uh, companionship is important, right? And so they might have a girlfriend or two. Uh, and then, you know, you've got this network of relationships. And the girlfriend, well, I mean, the man's not really fully supporting her. Maybe he's just giving her a little bit of money. It's not prostitution. It's, it's kind of a, it's a relationship, but it's not enough to make the rent. So maybe she has another partner on the side as well. And like I said, this is well documented, uh, this kind of, these kind of networks happening with these migrant workers. And so you can imagine if one person here um, gets sick, spreads it to a partner, and that partner has another partner who gets sick, and that partner has partners, and so on and so on. And so now you have this network and the, uh, the infection can get out of control very, very quickly. So this concurrency thing uh, is, uh, is common um, in different areas of the world for different reasons. Uh, some parts of the world, uh, there's still polygamy. Um, like I said, it's obvious why this would be the case in the sex trade and migrant workers. And, um, and this is something that uh, we would like to you know, do better at uh, understanding and, and controlling the infection there. You'll wanna read about it. Uh, I recommend this book here. It was in the Canada Library, uh, amazing book on HIV and AIDS and talking about all the different, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things that, uh, and I'm sure if you're African, uh, something that probably bothers you is, is when people, you know, just say Africa, thinking like it's one country. Uh, there's hundreds of cultures there. And she kind of, you know, addresses this, you know, there's different issues in different countries. And uh, every, everybody, every country and every culture is, is unique in terms of uh, tackling this issue. And uh, she does a great job of kind of explaining that. Okay, so um, what about uh, risk for healthcare workers? So this will probably be you someday. Um, how can we prevent HIV? Well, usually uh, in many cases, you know, that might be part of someone's file. And, uh, you know, generally we're, we're, you know, using PPE in a lot of cases anyway, uh, with a, someone with HIV, whether you're um, their dentist or your nurse or your doctor, uh, just using a few extra uh, cares, right? You know, proper uh, PPE. Um, this is why uh, you're going to get training in, in handling and disposal of needles and other sharps and those kind of things. And, uh, you know, keeping things clean and, and sterile and disinfected. Um, it does happen once in a while. People get accidental needle stick injuries and things like that. And uh, typically what they do is put the person on a really high dose of antiviral drug right away and monitor, monitor them for, uh, for a year or so. so. My understanding that's still the protocol. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty rare, but it does happen once in a while that somebody does get exposed. And uh, usually, uh, usually giving the high dose of drugs immediately um, prevents the virus from, uh, from causing infection, but not always, unfortunately. So as I mentioned, I wanna talk about progression of uh, AIDS and HIV. And uh, so back to this little chart here, and uh, kinda of wanna show you this other chart in terms of what is going on here. And I know I have, um, I'm pretty sure I have some notes uh, uh, in, the, in the PDF that kinda of talk about this. Uh, I don't really have any room to squeeze it on here, but I want to just talk about what is going on at these different stages here. So like I said, in this acute stage, you're basically getting kind of a normal viral infection. It's infecting the lymphatic system. So you're getting mono-like illness, uh, you know, like I said, swollen lymph glands and fever and those kind of things. Sometimes people end up with a little bit of weight loss and diarrhea. I'm not really sure how HIV uh, affects the gut. But uh, eventually the immune system does mount a response and then you get into this asymptomatic phase. So in that case, um, I have a number here. It says that there's about a billion viruses are killed daily by the immune cell and about a million CD4 cells killed daily. That's insane that we can last so many years with that kind of uh, attack on our immune system. So eventually somewhere in here, not really shown in this chart, but I'm gonna draw just another little box. There's kind of a, um, 
you know, not a full-blown AIDS, but sort of a, an early immune system failure, initial symptoms kind of stage where sometimes people get more swollen lymph nodes, uh, sometimes, excuse me, sometimes a little bit of uh, weight loss, sometimes fever, uh, and something that uh, we're starting to see characterized a bit more in, in the literature is actually uh, some neurological symptoms. So a little bit, uh, sometimes people are getting kind of some early forms of dementia and whatnot at this stage. So at that point, somewhere right when the immune system is almost ready to fail, uh, we're starting to get some of those uh, more common uh, uh, infections. So shingles might pop up or uh, herpes virus, other herpes virus infections. And eventually uh, what we have is something called full-blown AIDS. So what is full-blown AIDS? We're looking at um, the CD4 cells. I think I have it on the next slide. CD4 cells are less than 200 cells per microliter of blood. So that's kind of a classical clinical definition of, uh, of AIDS. And at this point, you know, you're looking at getting uh, pneumonias, tuberculosis, rare cancers, rare fungal lung infections, those kind of things, right? And without treatment, uh, a person's lifespan is, is, you know, after getting infected is, is an average, I think, something like nine or 10 years. Like I said, it takes about eight years to get the full-blown uh, AIDS. And then after that, the decline uh, can be quite rapid, a year or two. So here, there's a number right there. It says, uh, in absence of therapy, uh, life's expected nine to 10 years. And uh, after developing AIDS, about nine months. So what about diagnosis? There it is. There's the 200 CD4 cells per microliter. Like I said, that's part of the, um, part of the AIDS diagnosis. Uh, and then, of course, all these other rare infections. And I guess the one thing that's missing on here is the presence of the HIV virus, of course. So if you take a look at this, Toxo comes up sometimes. Uh, Toxo doesn't come up as much anymore because uh, that's something we know to look for in people with HIV and we can treat them sort of preemptively. Uh, Cryptosporidium, uh, a bunch of these organisms I'm not even that familiar with, uh, uh, but a lot of these are things that are famous for being um, infecting immunocompromised individuals. So I'm just looking at here, I think I have, uh, I might go a minute or two over time here, but I'm, I'm actually pretty close to the end. So I will, uh, I will just go a couple minutes over today. That's okay. So uh, diagnosis, uh, we're looking for antibodies against the virus, because uh, the virus is usually too small to detect, and usually we're using some sort of ELISA assay. Um, there's these rapid tests now. I found this one here, this Aura Quick rapid test. So apparently it's sensitive enough to actually detect antibodies in the saliva. I don't know how that works. I didn't even know there were antibodies in the saliva. Um, so I'm gonna have to read up a bit more on that one. And usually if someone's test positive, they will do something called a Western blot uh, as a secondary test. It's more sensitive, it's more laborious. I'm not gonna discuss it other than to say it uses antibodies uh, and uh, kind of related to an ELISA test. So what do we do for treatment? We kind of talked about this already, that there's, uh, there's quite a few different drugs out there for HIV now. The big ones are these uh, uh, nucleoside analogs. So remember, they kind of look like nucleotides and nucle nucleotides and nucleosides. And, uh, you know, and they, they bind the viral enzymes uh, pretty tightly. Uh, there are other groups of reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and there are also protease inhibitors. So we're using a cocktail. So it turns out, like, if you just use one drug, right, the, the, the virus mutates like crazy. So it's actually pretty easy within one human body for it to, to eventually mutate and have resistance. So if you throw a cocktail at it, it's unlikely it's, gonna, it's going to evolve uh, multiple forms of resistance automatically. So these cocktails are kind of being formulated all the time um, with new drugs and new, new research coming out. But uh, you know, now we're at the stage, uh, historically, where there have been people born with HIV and they've been on these cocktails their entire life. And of course, uh, you know, um, I guess, you know, what does that mean, uh, you know, in terms of their health and all those kind of things and lots of questions that I don't know the answer to. Someone's asking if every patient gets their own cocktail. I am not sure. I think there are different um, camps on which drugs are more effective and, and some of them may cause uh, certain side effects in different people. So I'm guessing that's part of the regime. So uh, what about a vaccine? So uh, often we're looking at these targets, these glycoproteins. And uh, so, you know, uh, kind of like COVID-19, we've, we've thrown everything at it. We've uh, thrown the inactivated, the attenuated, the, uh, and, and, and this is really tough. 
uh, because as I mentioned before, HIV mutates. It mutates like crazy. So HIV mutates, I think it's something like 10 times faster than the flu virus, right? So this means that if we were able to make a vaccine, we would need like a new vaccine every couple of months. And never mind, think about it. There's not like one strain of HIV floating around the planet, right? There's millions of different strains floating around. So, we would, you know, in theory, we could make a custom vaccine for every person, but then we'd have to reformulate it every six months. Um, so, and that has been done, but it's super expensive. We can't be spending that kind of money on, on people uh, as much as we'd like to. Um, if you think about, like I said, the number of HIV genomes on the planet, right? with the number of people infected. Huge number. So it's probable that we have, uh, you know, viruses that are resistant to every drug that we have or ever will have, and possibly every uh, vaccine that we have. So we're, we're kind of, we're learning things though. And, uh, you know, what's interesting is that there have been some vaccines that, uh, that have shown some, uh, some protection, and, uh, and we're learning lots of things about the immune system. So um, who knows? Who knows where we'll be 20 years from now? Uh, I know there's some people that are very optimistic about this. So kind of the last thing I wanted to mention is that I, I said there was no cure, which was kind of a little bit of a white lie. Um, there's been, um, I think, about four people now that have been cured of HIV and AIDS. And uh, this guy here, he was initially known as the Berlin patient. You know, they were keeping his name confidential. Uh, but he came forward to say, no, I want people to hear my story. Um, this man, I think he was a UK resident and he had, uh, he had HIV and, uh, and he also had leukemia. And uh, so you may know with leukemia, sometimes uh, the treatment is to get a bone marrow transplant, right? So think about that, bone marrow, that's where your immune system cells are growing. And um, and uh, um, yeah, so he's getting an immune system transplant in some ways. So it turns out that uh, about 1% of the human population is naturally resistant to HIV. So we have our CD4 receptor is just a little bit different and, uh, and it doesn't bind the virus. So it turns out that the donor that he found for the bone marrow was one of those people. So they did this procedure, they gave him an immune system transplant and uh, for whatever reason, he went off his antiviral drugs. I don't know whether that was intentional or not, or whether he was just somebody. Some people just don't. They don't like the side effects. And the virus was gone. And they kept testing him and kept testing him, and they could never find the virus again. So there's been a, a few other people done this. I think the second person, they called him the London patient. I think there's been about four people done. This is, this is not something you can do routine. Uh, it's super expensive, very hard to find matches, and never mind finding a match with the person. But maybe in the future, um, you know, with, with genetic engineering techniques. Maybe in the future we can, we can do this kind of thing. We can find a way to make the procedure less invasive and cheaper uh, and more routine. So this was kind of exciting. Um, sadly enough, this guy uh, uh, just died. Like literally a month ago, I think the leukemia came back um, and it was in the news as the first person cured of HIV and AIDS. And anyway, very, very interesting story and, and giving some hope for some people. So that's kind of the end of this, uh, this topic. Sorry for going over a couple of minutes. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this is a complicated area uh, when we're dealing with sex and drugs and a virus that gives you a lifelong infection and hang around asymptomatically for a long time. Um, but uh, thanks for bearing with me and I will see everybody uh, next week. So take care.